clicking at one side. Ready? Let's start it. Okay. Okay. Welcome everybody to another season of the FPGA seminar. So uh, today's talk will be uh, Ibrahim Ahmed and Xu Zhao working under Olivier Trescasis and Von Betts on robust dynamic voltage scaling for FPGAs. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak in this uh, seminar. So, technology scaling has been driving the growth of the semiconductor industry for quite some time now. With each successive technology road, we're adding more compute capabilities to our chips, and this allowed us to solve problems that we couldn't have before. For example, we're now able to implement machine learning algorithms, specifically deep learning in CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs, and that's all because of the huge compute capabilities that we are packed into, into one chip. Unfortunately, nothing comes without a challenge, and technology scaling is no exception. With the end of the NARC scaling, supply voltage of chips are not scaling anymore, and this is causing a huge challenge in meeting the power-constrained budget given to the chips we have. Another problem is that as we are building smaller and smaller devices, it's harder to fabricate identical transistors, so we end up having a non-uniform device characteristics because of the PVT variation. This curve shows the supply voltage of uh, Altera slash Intel FPGAs with different technology nodes. So as you can see here in the <coughs> earlier technology nodes, VDD was scaling quite well with, with the technology node. But most recently, VDD has not been scaling. And from 40 nanometer all the way down to 14 nanometer, VDD is almost constant. And you can imagine how this is causing a huge problem. So we're having bigger chips with more and more transistors, but our VDD is still fixed. And we basically lost the strongest hammer we used to have to reduce power consumption given the transistors we keep on adding to the chips. And this power consumption is basically hindering FPGAs from entering low power mobile markets, such as IoT. And for the FPGAs to really succeed in penetrating the data center's market, they have to show superior performance per watt compared to other chips. So what we really need is innovation in bringing FPGA's power consumption down. And I really like this uh, quote by uh, IEEE fellow Kevin Zhang and VP of Intel's Technology and Manufacturing Group. They stated that the future of continuous scaling is dependent on adaptive power management and voltage scaling. And this implies that the conventional way of one size fits all is no longer working well with the newer technology nodes. So let's take a look at how PVT variation affects our device performances. So we could uh, get engineers, designers, an inverter to have a specific delay, but after we fabricate this inverter in mini chips, what we eventually get is not a single delay that we have designed, but rather a distribution of possible delays. And this comes from process variation. And this curve is also affected by the operating conditions. So as our temperature changes, as our VDD fluctuates, and even as the chip ages, we get different curves. How are we dealing with that right now? We're basically assuming the worst case situation because we cannot tell which inverter exactly is fast and which is slow. So our CAT tools, like the, our existing static timing anal analysis, assume that every inverter runs at the tail of these set of curves. You can see from this curve that I have so many inverters that are probably much faster than this, but because I can't identify which one is fast and which one is slow, I have to assume that all of them are at this point. So we have to add margins for slow devices, worst case temperature, worst case droop, and even aging effects. How bad are these margins? So we basically built an FR filter targeting a Cyclone 4 uh, 60 nanometer FPGA, and we ran it through our CAT tool, Quartus in that case. And Quartus reported that this FR filter can run at around 120 megahertz, giving the nominal supply voltage, which is 1.2 for this curve. But we specifically picked this application because it's a feed-forward application, and you can easily measure when is it failing as we overclock it. And that's what we did. So at 1.2, we overclocked it, and we found that the first failure we observed is at a much higher frequency than the tool reported. And this difference is basically the pessimism that the tool adds. A more interesting curve that we would like to know is how does this application, how does the Fmax of this application vary with, with supply voltage? And this is what we call the frequency voltage curve. So this blue curve here shows how fast this first filter can run on this specific chip that we tested at different voltages. Now, knowing this curve could give us great potential and many possibilities 
in power management and adaptive voltage scaling. So for example, a user can say, okay, I, wanna, I want to overclock my design at nominal voltage if I want to have high performance. But what you're more interested in is, okay, now assume we want to run it at the reported F max from the tool, but we want to run it at the lowest possible power consumption while not sacrificing any speed. From this curve, we can say that, okay, so at this speed, I can run it at almost with, with a 20% with a reduction in VDD without reducing any speed. And this is basically dynamic voltage scaling. So in dynamic voltage scaling, we're trying to find the minimum supply voltage that runs your application on your specific chip at the required speed. By reducing VDD, we're reducing both static and dynamic power consumption. And since dynamic power consumption is proportional to VDD squared and static power drops even faster, a small reduction in VDD goes a long way in terms of power savings. DVS itself is not a new idea. It has been out there for some time. CPUs have been using them and reaping their benefits, but FPGAs haven't. And FPGAs have this unique feature that hinders this uh, power reduction technique on FPGA, and that's the unknown critical path at fabrication time. So if I'm designing a processor or an ASIC, at design and manufacture time, I exactly know which parts of my circuit are timing critical, and I can mitigate, I can come up with solutions to enable DVS, like uh, mimic critical paths, or uh, adding special types of circuitry that would monitor my uh, critical paths. But in FPGAs, I don't have this luxury because I don't know what the critical parts are when I'm designing and manufacturing the FPGA. So uh, there has been some work in DVS, in FPG, uh, DVS on FPGAs in academia. And the most prominent work uses this online monitoring where they first identify the timing critical paths of the circuit. And then for each timing critical register, we add a shadow register. This shadow register is then clocked with a different clock, and by adapting the phase offset between the shadow clock and the main clock, you can measure the slack and reduce VDD accordingly. The problem with doing that is it first cannot, cannot target hard blocks, like BRAMs and ESPs. In hard blocks, your registers are buried, and you don't have observability over the input of the register itself. Another problem is that this adds area and power overhead while the application is running. And this overhead depends on how many critical registers do you have in your application. Uh, one other major problem is that if a path is time critical but it's not exercised for some time, your system would assume that the circuit could run at the fastest speed, but then if this path gets exercised suddenly, you'll have timing faults that you cannot recover from. So what we're proposing is exploiting the FPGA programmability by performing an offline design and chip-specific calibration to enable DVS and FPGAs while mitigating these shortcomings. Uh, before going into our proposed flow, I just want to show a slide of how the conventional design cycle looks like now. So we take an application, we give it to our CAT tool, Quartus for this, uh, in this case. We check that it passes timing, it generates an application bit stream. We then run our application with the nominal VDD and make sure that we don't uh, exceed the Fmax reported by the tool. We're proposing a shift from this conventional design cycle. So our proposed DVS flow looks like this. Again, we're going to take an application from the user. We take it to a CAT system. And we're, we're, we will generate an application bit stream just like the conventional design cycle. But our CAT system will also generate calibration bit streams. Now, these calibration bit streams have replicas of the critical path of the application, along with on-chip heaters and tester circuitry to measure the delay of these critical paths. After generating this calibration bit stream, we perform a calibration procedure where we identify the frequency versus voltage curves that I talked about, but at different temperatures. And we call this the calibration table. So each one of this table is at a different temperature. And for each temperature, we store for this specific application on this specific chip, what's the Fmax at different voltages. And then our last step is running the application that was generated regularly through the CAT tool using the knowledge that we now have, which is how fast can I go at which voltage? And we can use voltage scaling at that stage. Uh, I'm going to focus first on the CAT system and the FPGA part. And then Chuzo will talk later on the rest of the project. I just want to highlight here that from this flow, you can see that there is a CAT component, there is FPGA component, and there is significant power electronics component. And I think that the collaboration with uh, Chuzo and Olivier really was key to the success we've reached in this project. 
Okay, so generating this calibration bit streams. Let's first talk about the objective from this calibration bit streams. We need to perform calibration for each FPGA, and if we want to account for aging effects, we might also want to do this calibration procedure periodically or at every power. So we need that the calibration procedure be fast. The second thing is we need it to be robust. We need to make sure that the calibration table values really are not overestimating the performance of the circuit. Otherwise, we get into timing faults. And finally, we want to do all this process without adding any extra manual steps to the user. So we need it to be automated. And that's where we came up with our CAT2 name, FROP. It's fast, robust, and automated calibration. Uh, OK, so now let's take a step back and see how do you measure an application Fmax. Uh, so one, like one idea that jumps to mind is can I get the application and then exercise it with random input test vectors and check the output while sweeping the clock frequency until I detect any failures? Well, this might work for feed-forward applications or combination circuits without buried states. But in general, most applications have buried states and feedback paths that makes it infeasible makes it impossible to test all the timing critical paths inside the application by just exercising the primary inputs of the circuit. So if we did that, we'd be overestimating the application Fmax and thus resulting in failures when the circuit is operating. What we really want to do is we need to measure the delay of all time critical paths inside this application, and that's the only way we, where we can say for sure now we have identified the Fmax of the application without any overestimation. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about how do we measure the delay of a single path. So let's take a small example. This is an application that the user designed, and we've identified that this is the only critical path in this circuit. Our first step, our first step is to replicate this design in the calibration design. Replication here means we're gonna use the exact same resources, exact same flip-flops, LUTs, LUT inputs, all the exact same routing resources to make sure that we're measuring the exact transistors or the exact devices being used in the application. The next step is we're going to change the LUT masks of the LUTs we're using to make sure that we are able to sensitize this timing path. Next step is we add some control signals. First, we add the edge control signals. This gives us control over what type of edge transition do we get across the lookup table. And then we add input stimulus and error checking circuit. And by basically sweeping the clock frequency and detecting the first error, we've identified the delay of this single path. Uh, then the question is, is it enough to measure the top critical path of an application and then say this measures the delay of the application? And the answer is no. Because of PVT variation, the top critical path or the timing critical path in an application could vary from chip to chip. Or even in the same chip under different operating conditions, this could vary. So if we really want to ensure a robust measurement, we need to measure the delay of many near critical paths, not only the top one. And Back to our objective, if we want to make this fast, we need to use as few calibration bit streams as possible, because these calibration bit streams are programmed sequentially. Okay, so what's the problem with measuring many paths at the same time? If they're all disjoint paths, then that's fine. We basically repeat the exact same procedure for a single path multiple times, and we don't have any extra troubles to take care of. Problems start occurring when paths overlap. So first we define overlapping paths as paths that share the exact same lookup table, but using different inputs. So in this example, path one and path two overlap because they share lot C, and each one of them is using a different input. Let's say now I want to measure the delay of path one. If I want to guarantee that I'm not missing any timing failure, I need to fix all off-path inputs. Otherwise, two timing failures would hide each other, and at the sync register, I could not observe a timing failure. So to make sure that I'm observing every timing failure, I need to fix off-path inputs. But to do so, I can't test path one and path two at the same time, because now I have conflicting conditions. I want this path to be fixed, and this node to be fixed, and at the same time, toggle path two, so that's not possible. So we have to create different test phases to test paths that cannot be tested in parallel. To do so, we first add fixed control signals to our lookup table. This allows us to fix the output of any lookup table. And by doing so, we guarantee fixing off-path inputs for all paths that we're testing. And the second thing is we allow our test controller to cycle through these different test phases sequentially. So after now adding the fix and the edge control signals, the lookup table, that the mask that we're using in our calibration, now looks like this. It's basically still the XOR 
with the edge control signal to decide what type of edge transition I, I want to have. But then we add this fixed control signal to have the ability to fix the output of a lookup table. And one thing to note here is we only add this fixed control signal when we need it. Sometimes we don't need to fix the output of a LUT, so we won't add this fixed control signal. And we developed more LUT masks to test Cyclone 4 carry chains because they have different, they have like hardened carry chains, so we've tested also uh, carry chains with the same controllability. Okay, so the next problem we have is that given these constraints, we cannot test everything in one bit three. So I said that to test the path through a LUT, we need to add control signals, but this means that if Let's say I have a four input lookup table and I want to test four paths that use all the four inputs. I can't do that because I have to add control signals. So in this simple example, I can't test path one through four in the same bit stream. I would need to divide them in multiple bit streams. Second problem is some in, spe in special deconvergent fan out connections, it's impossible to test two paths at the same bit stream. So for example, this uh, deconvergent fan out between path two and path one, if I want to test path two, I need to fix the off path input here, but this is also part of path two. So I cannot test path two while I have this connection. So if I want to test path two and path one, I have to test them in two separate bit streams. And there are several more constraints, including the number of lab inputs constraints and the carry chains constraints. So now we have another problem, the, the problem of not having, not being able to test all paths in one bit stream. So we need somehow to schedule this path testing to make sure that we're minimizing the number of calibration bit streams and at the same time recovering all the important paths that we need to test. <coughs> and since we can't ask the user to do all to solve all these problems manually every time we create a new design, so we built this FROC CAD tool. So the overview looks like this. The user will give us an application, it would run through Qantas regularly and it would generate an application bit stream without any extra steps. And then our CAT tool would then hook up to Quartus and extract timing critical paths from Quartus STA, and it would then generate the calibration HDL and location and routing constraints that are needed to generate all the calibration bit streams. To do so, our tool passes through four different phases. First, it schedules which paths should be tested in which bit stream. Then it, repl it replicates these paths. It then groups these replicated paths into test phases. And finally, it generates the test controller. Note here that the user did not do any extra manual steps. Just gave us the application, and the output was an application bit stream and a set of calibration bit streams. Okay, now let's look at the first step, path scheduling. So time and critical paths tend to overlap, to overlap quite frequently. So you can have many paths that share the exact same resources. It's important here to identify which paths are more important for testing. Some paths would be redundant. If we cover a set of paths, then they would be redundant. So our first step, that FROC does is that it identifies these important paths for testing. To do so, it first models the delay of each circuit element as the Gaussian distribution, built around the delay reported by Quartus. The second step is we perform a Monte Carlo simulation where we sample the, the Gaussian distribution, and at each Monte Carlo sample, we identify what was the critical path in this Monte Carlo sample, and then we go on and formulating an integer linear programming problem that then says, okay, I have all these important paths now, I'm gonna schedule which paths to test, to test in which calibration bit stream, so that I minimize the probability of overestimating an application, and at the same time, I'm minimizing the calibration bit stream. Just one side result to note here, here is that with one calibration bit stream, we're able to test most of the paths in most applications, and we only needed to go up to three calibration bit streams to cover all the important paths in the wide set of benchmarks that we tested. So one was almost enough, three was definitely enough for all benchmarks. Okay, so now we've scheduled what paths to test in which bit stream. Let's simplify it a bit and say this again was the application. And we said we're gonna test these four different paths in one bit stream. Our first step is replicate that and add the control signals, just like I described earlier. And note here that for this specific lot, we didn't need to add a fixed control signal, but for these two lots, we added fixed and edge control signals. The next step now is to group these paths into test phases. So we'd, love, we'd like to test all of them in parallel. This would reduce our calibration time. But since all of them share the exact same sync register, in this specific example, we'll have to test them sequentially. But to get a better result, we formulate this as a graph coloring problem. We represent each path as a vertex, and we add edges between paths that cannot be tested at the same time. So in this example, 
if we're coloring this graph, we would color it with four different colors. Each color here represents a test phase. But in general, this is not the case. So in our experiments, we've tested more than 5,000 paths using only 17 test phases, which reduces the calibration time. OK, so the final step that FROC does is it generates this test controller. So now we've replicated the paths. We've generated this test controller that sets the appropriate control signal for each test phase and sequentially loops over all the test phases and it detects any error, any timing error uh, reported from these replicated tasks. Okay, so now we've reached this part of the project. We've generated the calibration bitstream, and now Shuza will take over and tell us how the calibration procedure continues. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, so I will talk about how the, um, uh, the system level hardware works, how to automate this. Okay, so after first step, we should have we should have uh, uh, two bit streams uh, in the memory. So we'll first program the FPGA with the uh, calibration uh, bit streams. So the on-chip configuration of the FPGA will look like this. So the red line here represents the critical path. Here I'm just showing one, but uh, uh, as Abraham mentioned, you should have multiple critical paths on-chip. And those orange spots are the heater circuits, which are essentially uh, fast switching the logics. So we use this to consume power on the FPGA to, in, uh, to heat up the temperature. So I'll talk about why do we do this later. Um, so the critical paths will be uh, exercised uh, with the clock generated by this off-chip frequency generator, which can, um, which can sweep the whole uh, frequency range. And at the end of a critical path, we have checking circuit to check if the critical path fails or not. And this, this external uh, temperature sensor will measure the chip temperature. OK, so this is how the, um, the calibration works. So this is the, the waveform uh, for the core voltage. So at the beginning, the core voltage is 1.2, which is the nominal. So when the calibration starts, the core voltage drops to uh, be minimum. And uh, the external frequency generator generates a clock starting from the minimum value and then start to increase. So at T0, uh, frequency reach F1, and we see this arrow flag goes up, means the critical path fails at this voltage. So we know for V minimum, the failing frequency is F1. And then we increase the core voltage by delta V. So right now the, the core voltage is V1. And then we keep increasing the frequency to find the failing frequency for, v, for V1. So after doing all this, we know the failing frequency for all the voltages. So eventually we should get a, um, a curve like this, so which, which show us the failing frequency at different core voltage. Um, and we know that the delay is a strong function of the die temperature, so we should consider temperature in the lookup table as well. So this is what we do. Uh, so starting from the room temperature, we turn on those heaters on chip. So the temperature of the chip starts to increase. And we do one calibration like this at each target temperature. So while temperature increases, we keep doing this calibration. So in the end, we should get a uh, so, uh, so after doing this, uh, we we'll get a, a DBS lookup table, we call it calibration uh, ca table, and we will save it in the memory. <coughs> so this is how the calibration table looks like. <coughs> so for different temperature, we'll see uh, at different core voltage, there's a corresponding failing frequency. So this is the lookup table we will, um, we will use when the application is running. So the small controller on chip will refer to this calibration table to find the minimum operating frequency. Ah, oh, sorry, operating voltage for the, uh, for the FPGA. OK, so after we get the calibration table, we move to the uh, third step, which is the uh, application uh, application operation. OK, so we have this calibration table in the memory. And then we program the FPGA again with the uh, application bit stream. Uh, so as you can see, the on-chip configuration now is the application, but the critical paths are exactly the, uh, using the same resources. So when it's running, um, that, that feature, uh, when the application is running, it will refer to this calibration table and the control, uh, talk to the uh, power stage and uh, set the proper output voltage for the FPGA. Uh, one issue with this, uh, with this scheme is that if you look at the, um, uh, the power delivery network of uh, FPGA, so this is the FPGA and this is the power regulator. Um, the feedback point of the power uh, voltage regulator is usually on, locally on the power board here, V out. And uh, the core voltage is here at the FPJ. So you see there is like resistance in the power delivery pass. Uh, 
So when the FPGA draws large current, there is a voltage drop between uh, VO and V core. We call it IR drop. So if your uh, if the power regu power regulator uh, set the voltage according to the uh, referring to the calibration table, the core voltage will actually be lower than the uh, than the than, than the calibration table. So then we need to um, we need to compensate for the uh, IR voltage drop. So here, our RV to D is the resistance from the voltage sensing point here to the FPGA die. And uh, we can just simply add this term, I load multiplied by RV to D to compensate for the IR drop in the uh, PDN network. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, hardware system architecture. So the FPGA board we're using is a DE2115 uh, evaluation board, which has 60 uh, nanometers, like four FPGA on it. Uh, the, power, the power stage is a customized power board um, with a two-phase spot converter in digital uh, digital control. Uh, and the external clock generator, they can generate clock from one kilohertz up to 68 uh, megahertz. And the temperature sensor um, is a thermal coupler, so we attach it on top of the FPGA to sense the uh, FPGA temperature. Uh, note that uh, uh, more advanced FPGAs have on-chip temperature sensor diodes, so we don't need this. Um, and this is the actual hardware setup. So this is the FPGA board, um, and the power board is sitting on top. So the output is connecting from the power board to the uh, FPGA board directly, and we disconnect the power stage uh, on, this, uh, on this evaluation board. The temperature sensor here is a, is a thermal coupler, and this is the testing point. We put it on top of the FPGA to measure the chip temperature. Um, the frequency generator is here, so we send the frequency through the SMA clock input to the FPGA board. Um, so this is the on-chip configuration. Um, so this is for the calibration stage, and this is the application. So as you can see, the on-chip on configuration is totally different, but they're uh, critical paths are highlighted. They're using the exact same resources. Um, so this is the experiment waveform for the uh, self-calibration part. So at the beginning, uh, the core voltage is at 1.2 volt, which is nominal. Um, so this is the current. As you can see, it's pretty high uh, because the heaters are drawing a lot of current to heat up the chip. So when it reach here, um, when it reach the target temperature, and then the calibration starts. So first of all, the voltage drops to the minimum, and then the frequency starts to increase to find the first failing point. So at this point, uh, we find the failing frequency for this voltage, so the error flag will go up, and uh, it will just keep looking for failing frequencies for different voltages. So this is a zoom-in uh, zoom uh, voltage, so as you can see, the voltage keeps rising. Uh, this uh, this zoom-in waveform is not from, this waveform is from a previous research, but it's just to show you how the detailed waveform looks like. So as you can, as you can see, this is the error signal, so uh, when, the error go, when the error shows up, the core voltage increase to search for the next error point. Okay, uh, so after doing the, uh, all the calibration, the voltage goes back to normal and the current goes up again to heat up the chip uh, for the next uh, calibration point. Okay, so this is the uh, overall calibration waveform. So starting from room temperature, which is 35 degree, and we turn on different numbers of uh, different numbers of uh, heaters to heat up the chip. So the uh, temperature rise is relatively linear, and each spike here represents one calibration like this. So we did it at those target temperatures every five degrees. So the whole process takes about one minute. And uh, one calibration like this takes about 140 milliseconds, which is uh, quite fast. So, so you can consider the temperature is constant during this calibration. Um, so this is the calibration table we got. So we tried uh, two different applications. One is FIR filter, another is, the, is a crossbar switch. Um, so these curves are the uh, calibration results. So as you can see, at lower temperature, uh, oh, sorry, lower core voltage, the temperature doesn't really affect the failing frequency that much. At higher voltage, um, you know, the temperature affects the failing frequency. So lower temperature always have a higher failing frequency. 
this black dot here is the nominal operating point rep, uh, reported by the CAD tool. So as you can see how much gap you have here. Mm. Uh, and uh, this highlighted red curve is the actual failing frequency of the application. So we manually measure the failing frequency of the application to see where it locates on the curve. Uh, so as you can see, this curve is slightly higher than the uh, calibration results, which means the uh, application fails at a slightly higher failing frequency which we think mainly because of the actual actual application does not hit the critical path while it's operating. So, uh, so the way we're doing it is more conservative. Uh, similar for the crossbar. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so this is the measured uh, RV2D, so the resistance from the voltage sensing point to, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, on the FPGA die. Uh, we actually put sensors on different locations on FPGA and we find that the resistance as, is actually location dependent. So you can choose which resistors, uh, which resistance you need to use based on the location of the critical path. So for this uh, for the application we tested, because the, the critical path is across the chip, so we pick the worst case resistance, which is uh, 16 milli, milli ohm uh, in our experiment. Okay, so this is the DBS operation on the crossbar switch. So on the right hand side, uh, I'm showing the calibration results at 180 uh, megahertz. So as you can see, the temp when the temperature increases, the core voltage increases as well. So this dash line here shows the, um, so when the temperature increases, this is the core voltage we need to have. And uh, the actual output voltage of the converter is slightly higher because we add this uh, IR voltage compensation to compensate for the IR job. Um, so there's another, uh, another group of uh, experiment on the FIR filter. Um, so this one is uh, operating at 170 megahertz, which is the reported frequency. So you can see it can operate at a much lower uh, voltage. Uh, so the red line here, red dash line here is the core voltage and the, because of the higher job compensation, the output voltage is slightly higher. Um, on the right hand side is the application running at 180 megahertz. So the temperature increase pretty fast because it draws more, uh, more current. Um, so the core voltage is adapting according to the uh, temperature feedback and we have output higher than this because the IR job compensation is higher in this case because it draws more current. Um, so this is the power saving on those two applications. Uh, so this black dot here is the nominal operating point. We use it as a nominal point, 100% uh, uh, nominalized power and 100% uh, nominalized frequency. So this red curve here uh, is, uh, is the power consumption when you fix the core voltage at 1.2 volt. So you can keep increasing the frequency up to here, and this the power consumption is quite linear. Uh, the, blue, uh, the green line here shows the um, measured DBS limit. So we manually measure the failing frequency uh, on this application, and we get this curve. And this orange curve shows the, um, uh, the power consumption with the proposed DBS scheme with the IR job compensation. So it's like it's a little bit cons conservative, but as I mentioned, <coughs> that you may not uh, exercise the critical path when it's running, so it's good to be conservative. Um, so if you look at the nominal point, uh, you've got about 40% saving in the energy, or if you operate at the fixed power budget, you can operate uh, about 28% faster. Okay, so um, conclude the, the research. Um, so the proposed scheme we tested on two benchmarks, uh, give us around 40% energy saving or 25% uh, performance enhancement uh, in the FPGAs. And the, the whole process is highly automatic, uh, you can guarantee no error while the application is running. Um, and while the application is running, we, get, uh, we can guarantee we're, we have the minimized on-chip overhead. And for the future work, I want to include hard blocks in this uh, self-calibrated uh, scheme. Uh, and uh, we, we need to add proper guard, guard bands in the calibration table to account for effects like crosstalk or the, uh, the transient in the power supply. Uh, and uh, we can also do architectural uh, changes to the FPGA to benefit, benefit more from the DBS. For example, use a, a wider VD operation range or multiple voltage islands. Um, yeah, that's.
So it, it can be extended to cover whole time, uh, but I don't think whole time would be that big of an issue because as we reduce, like our main objective here is to reduce VDD. So as we're reducing it, we're basically giving more uh, hold slack. We're, we're, we're affecting the clock path, but at the same time, we're extending the delay of the timing path itself. So I don't think it would be that big of an issue given that we're extending the delay of the path itself. But it's one of the things that we're considering how to calibrate for to in the calibration procedure. So just a question. Uh, about the uh, the tongueing rate, I mean, I guess the, when the application may be very idle at some point, and then the burst of data goes through, how do you include the uh, the tongueing rate of the application into the analysis, or uh, does it matter? Uh, no, so, so it does. So like, I guess one of the uh, biggest challenges that we have in this offline calibration is that it doesn't account for fast transit. So if your application has been idle for some time, and then once of a sudden you start consuming a spike of fire, then your voltage will drop pretty fast. And this is hard to account for offline, but it's even hard to account for online. And that's something that we're looking into, uh, how to quickly adapt to current spikes. We're thinking of whether to yeah, have like block gating schemes where when you know that the current spike is coming, but this would need more input from the user. If we know that the current spike is coming, we would then increase the supply voltage, allow for the voltage drop to stay within the range of operating uh, without timing failures, and then go back to the regular scheme. But it's, it, th this is one of the biggest challenges that we have in an offline calibration. But you wouldn't have to do calibration again. Once you have the table, I guess, if I give you a fair amount of warning, okay, well, that is coming. Already with the pre-calibrated data, you should be able to know yeah, that's how far it can go. Yeah, yes, yeah. But, but this would, yeah, like uh, we'd ask the user to tell us that a big data is coming. Uh, so this is the, yeah, this is for different users. Yeah. 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 That shouldn't be hard. So then I'll follow that. So as for guard bands, do the results that you report include crosstalk guard bands? Uh, like the, the graph of power savings that already include a crosstalk guard band for calibration, because calibration can't capture all the crosstalk effects. Yes, uh, do. So that one was in there. And they just talked about load transients, which is an open an open one, how to guard that exactly. or how to adapt. Um, just a clarifying question on that. So it is a challenge. Is it a challenge that's unique to offline approaches, or is it one that basically all DVS approaches uh, yeah. You know, struggle with. Like yes, it's so it's, yeah, it, it's one that all DVS approaches struggle with. Uh, so for example, in IBM Power 7 and Power 8, they do DVS with this critical path monitoring. So in their chip, they have critical path monitors that monitor the critical path. But even then, they have problems with current spikes. So the way they handle that right now is they have a dynamic PLL on chip. When they detect the current spike, they decrease the clock frequency to allow for enough timing slack. And then when, the, when they recover from that, then they bring up the clock frequency again. So it's a, it's a challenge that's not unique for offline calibration. It's, it's unique for any application that's basically pushing the operating towards the boundaries uh, yeah. that it can operate on. Now, the other thing is, the question I had is, in the data center where you have a lot of cooling, a lot of fans cooling off the SPDAs, for example, does that mean I can even go higher in the clock? Uh, so it depends on what you want. If you want, like, Given this information that we have, given this calibration table, now you have uh, enough freedom. Do I want to go higher with the clock frequency, given that I, I know that it's safe to operate? Or given that now I'm having a cooler temperature, do I want to operate with the same speed, but save more power, and thus like, save more uh, dollars, right? I, I'm going to have to cool less. I'm going to have to spend less money on energy. So you have the choice to go either way, given this information in the calibration table. Yeah, because I mean, sometimes the, some server might be closer to the cooling rack and sometimes could be farther away. So that could even affect yes, where, where do you do the calibration? Where do you do the calibration? 
Right, so this is the advantage of doing this uh, chip by chip, because you can do this specific um, for this chip on this application. So each chip has its own calibration table. So it doesn't matter uh, where the, the location of the chip is, it just you know, yeah. refer to its own calibration table. Yeah. So you can operate faster if it's closer to cooling equipments, and it will be slower if it's far away. Yeah, and, and since that itself is a challenge to have the same application running at different frequencies, so one safe way of benefiting from that without having the troubles of what frequency am I running at is I'm running at a fixed frequency, but I'm saving you money. Like if you put me in a cooler place and save you some more money, it, yeah, like that. How do you know you've selected enough critical paths? Uh, so that's a, oh wait, that's a good question. So first, like, uh, from our own experiments, we observed that covering 10%, like covering paths with delay up to 90% of the critical path in our small set of benchmarks in the chips we measured, it, it seemed fine. And that observation was also shared with previous work uh, from the guys who did online monitoring. So they also uh, like considered a register to be time critical if it falls within this 90%. But we've done some analysis on by basically now we have this variation model, right? So our tool now models the variation of each circuit element. So we can say, what's the probability of a path being critical on some chip? And that's what you do with our Monte Carlo simulation. And by doing that, we can say, okay, so now what's the probability of, underestimate, of overestimating an Fmax? And that's equivalent to saying, what's the probability of not testing the critical path? And in our experiments using the variation model that we use, we show here that yeah, like these, these two curves basically show the probability of overestimating an Fmax with one calibration base streams or with three calibration base streams. And you can see that with three calibration base streams, the probability goes down in, in most of the applications we've tested, less than one in a million, and it, it's only 10.95 in two applications. I didn't quite catch what the probability is that it for all paths inside of the circuit or for uh, one. Okay, so, so this probability yeah. is basically the probability of overestimating the F max. Of the entire design or for one path? Of the entire design. Okay, great. And we compute that by basically computing something called, like we define as the statistical criticality of each path, and that's the probability that the path is the critical path on some chip under some operating condition. And by making sure that we measure all the paths that could be critical and some chip under some operating condition, we minimize this probability. But of course, this is this depends on the variation model that we take into account, and that's why our tool is able to take different variation models. But we definitely need more data from the industry to yeah to build a proper model. Just to suggest a suggestion for an extension of it, you know, for any one like your FIR filter design, you can make multiple implementations of it that. Fmax reported by static timing might be around the same, but they use different yeah. sets of resources, right? Okay. So you could do this sort of twice for two different histories, right? And see how much variability there is there, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's so a great idea. sort of try to exploit within the variations. Yeah, and we can easily do that, like with random seeds and see, yeah, how we use different resources, and yeah, that's a great idea. We'll definitely try that. I'm asking a lot of questions. Does anyone ask that? So you have a LUT that you then instrument, with your, you basically take critical path, you put in LUTs and you instrument it. What happens if the critical path that you want to analyze, there's no additional LUT inputs you can tap your instrumentation to? Uh, okay, so, so let's say I have one critical path, and in the application, the LUT, the crit, uh, LUTs that goes across this critical path are, okay, like all the LUT inputs are not free. Thank you. We basically, we extract this local table, and use the lookup table input that the critical path use, and we ignore the other inputs. Okay. Now the question is, what if like all the other inputs are also part of a critical path? Then that's when we come into this path scheduling scheme. Now if I have four critical paths that use four different inputs, mm -hmm. now I have to choose. Like I, I, I can't test all of them. I'm gonna have to use this uh, like model and the Monte Carlo simulation to pick which ones to choose, and I schedule different paths in different bit streams, oh. and at the end I report what's the probability of overestimating an Fmax. So if it seems like a higher probability, by adding one more calibration bit streams, we'll be able to cover more paths and dec decrease this uh, probability. 
Maybe I'm asking too many questions. <laughs> uh, you probably have thought about this, but on my in your original implementation, let's say the critical path used a bunch of routing switches. And in the original implementation, there could have been some sort of Steiner points that branch off that routing path. And although the routing switches are buffered, it's probably fairly fan out independent, right? Yes. But at least in Xilinx FPGAs, I don't know about the Altera ones, even when you turned on another switch, for example, yeah. you get a, maybe a slight delay effect on my critical path, True. right? Not as bad as if it wasn't fully buffered routing switches where you're seeing the load of that yeah. non-critical. So yeah. it seems to me when you riff out just the critical path and focus just on the critical path, you might be slightly optimistic in that you're ignoring a tiny little bit of loading and turning on the routing mux up to the buffer, yeah. sort of. And that's why, and that's why uh, FROP also models the fan outs. When we extract a critical path, okay. we want to monitor how many fan outs does each routing resource use. Okay. And we see what type of, like if it's a vertical wire of length 4, if it's a horizontal wire of length x. And we use the exact same wire when we replicate the critical path. So we replicate the path, and we also replicate the fan out along the path. Not all the way to, the, to where this fan out so, is going. So you actually create little antennas kind exactly. of go nowhere. Uh, it, they, they end up going somewhere because otherwise the tool would remove them. Sure. But we don't care where, where, where basically where they go. So you did do that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I have a comment on hold because I think it's a really good question yeah. actually about hold. So so I agree with both of you. I think hold is something to to worry about. Although I agree with you, it's on many designs it's going to be much less likely to fail than than setup just because the way voltage scaling works. The ones that I worry the most about would be complicated holds between related clocks, like some transfers that are yeah, quite complicated. They're two different clocks that are off by 90 degrees. There might be a type yeah. hold constraint, and the way way it gets harder or easier is a complex function now of the difference between some delays. Um, the so maybe this is not a question. At the end, I'll try to get a question. No question. <laughs> or you can see if you agree with me. Uh, the the infrastructure that uh, Ibrahim and Shuze have created can be extended to handle that because you can create calibration paths to check that. Um, so it's more it's more work, but you know they both love work. So <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's hard. It's possibly harder for overclocking though. So for the power reduction focus, which is kind of our main focus, it, you can replicate the exact same clock frequencies. You know, 100 megahertz here and 100 megahertz shifted by 90 degrees here. Uh, and replicate the whole critical path and check it. Um, I think it's harder. To, it's harder to think about what happens if you start saying well, I'm overclocking, and now I want to yeah see what happens if I increase the frequency on that because you really the, the transfers you worry about for hold are quite complicated, and thinking about how they vary as you overclock can get quite complicated. But I think the extension for power reduction is is not that hard because you check the same path. I don't know. So anyway, I guess my question is, do you agree That's with a that good or question, not? That's uh, <laughs> 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 Any more questions? Thank you for listening. Okay. So. So we have pizza here, and everybody's welcome to stay. And we thank Intel for uh, providing the pizza. And Dave's here, and Jason's here. Okay, well thank you very much.